one. Thank you all for joining this evening. This is the Board of Directors of the Denver Regional Council of Governments meeting on Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. I'm Chair Ashley Stolzman and I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.30. Because of COVID-19, the meeting's being held electronically and is being recorded. Melinda Stevens will now do a roll call of our members and alternates. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, members of the board, just be ready to unmute yourself uh, to let us know that you're here. And if we miss you on the first go around, um, I will ask people to raise hands virtually uh, so we can make sure that you're taken down for the record. All right, here we go. Uh, Aaron Brockett. Present. Adam Cushing. <laughs> Allison Coombs. Present. Bill Gipp. Connected. Bob Pfeiffer. John Marriott. Bud Starker. Present. Claire Levy. On the screen. Colleen Whitlow. David Adams. David Spellman. Deborah Mulvey. Present. Don Cognac. David Whelan, George Lance. Present. George Teal. Abe Layden. Herb Atchison. Yes. Jacob LeBure. Dana Gutwein. Jim Dale. Paul Hassman, Jim Kumerly, Jamie Jeffrey, Jason Gray. Here. Jeff Baker. Here. Jessica Sandgren. Julia Marvin. Joan Peck. Here. We appreciate that. John Dyack. Here. Josie Cockrell. Here. Julie Duran Mullica. Nope. Joyce Downing. Kara Tanucci. Here. Karina Elrod. Pamela Grove. Catherine Whitman. Jackie Thomas. Kevin Flynn. Here. Christopher Larson. Larry Vidum. Here. Linda Montoya. Celeste Arner. Linda Olson. Happy Earth Day tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Lynette Kelsey. Here, thanks. <clears throat> Margo Ramsden. Michael Hillman, Neil Shaw, Tim mm -hmm. Howard, present, Nicholas Angelo, Holly Rogan, present, Nicholas Williams, here, Nicole Frank, uh, present, Paul Sutton, Sean Foray, Rachel Binkley, present, Randy Wheel, Russell Stewart, Randy Wheelock, George Marlin, Roy Palmer, Sally Daigle, Stephanie Walton. Hello. Steve Odoricio. Lynn Baca. Present. Steve Conklin. Here. Tammy Mauer. Present. Tracy Kraft Tharp. Yes. Webb Sill. 
And Webb, I see that you are raising your hands. So we'll count you as present. Uh, William Lindstedt. Here. Winshaw. Present. All right. And if there was anyone that was brought over after your name was called, if you want to raise your hand, I can read it off really quick for the record. Oh, Bill Van Meter, uh, Neil Shaw, uh, Jacob LeBure. All right. Jim and, Dale. Oh, Jim Dale, thank you so much. Uh, and then Julie Duran Mullica, I do see your hand raised. All right. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it back to our chair. And Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you so much. And so Commissioner Sill, I see your hand is still up. So I'll just double check with you if you wanted to let us know something at this time. Um, you'll just need to dial star six to unmute yourself. All right, thank you very much. Not seeing anything. So we will move on with the agenda and could I please get a motion to approve the agenda? Commissioner Baker? Yes, I make the motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. And thank you very much. I think the second was from uh, Director Starker. Thank you very much, Director Starker. Any discussion of the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to our strategic informational briefing. Uh, we'll have a briefing on the Employee Traffic Reduction Program, ETRP. Um, tonight, Rick Kaufman is going to go through a presentation with us, and I'll just turn it right over to him. Pay close attention. This will be very interesting for everybody. Go ahead, Rick. Thanks so much. And before I get started, I wanted to mention that Clay Clark, who's the supervisor of the Climate Change Unit at the Air Pollution Control Division, is also in the meeting. Um, and he might uh, help out with answering questions at the end of the presentation. So if you can um, give him Done. access to unmute. Thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> well, hello everyone and good evening. Uh, thanks for having us today. My name is Rick Coffin and I'm an air quality planner with the Colorado Air Pollution Control Division. And today I'm going to be providing an overview of the Employee Traffic Reduction Program, also known as ETRIP that the state is currently considering. My presentation today will cover where the ETRIP proposal originated from, how it fits within this, the state's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and ozone emissions, some of the options for meeting the requirements of an ETRIP, the benefits that ETRIP can provide, and examples of successful ETRIP programs in, implemented by employers. Next slide. So the ETRIP con <clears throat> concept first started as a measure to address ozone pollution in our ozone non-attainment area in the Denver Metro and North Front Range of Colorado. This area has been officially out of attainment with federal air quality standards for ozone since late 2007. And because the area has failed to meet those standards since then, <clears throat> we've been reclassified first as a moderate non-attainment area in 2015. And then more recently, as a serious non-attainment area by EPA this past January of 2021, which the state knew was coming. Transportation is a significant contributor to ozone formation through pollutants like nitrogen oxides or NOx and volatile organic compounds or VOCs that are released from internal combustion engines. So addressing transportation emissions is key to addressing ozone. So as part of that effort, the Regional Air Quality Council, or RAC, has worked since last year to develop an ETRIP framework with input from local partners such as transportation management associations, since ETRIP is a strategy for helping to re reduce ozone that has been adopted or implemented in other ozone non-attainment areas or as part of efforts to re reduce transportation emissions. We really give a lot of credit to the RAC for initiating the process around ETRIP and APCD has basically taken their work as um, the foundation or starting point or framework for the rule that we are developing for our proposal. So next slide, please. So I'll, I'll start by talking about the process for developing and evaluating an ETRIP proposal for a potential rulemaking. 
So the state is currently in, in the information gathering phase for that. And one of the most critical elements for that part of the process is stakeholder outreach and feedback, which is what we're doing today. So outreach is, has been ongoing and we've sent out over 2,760 letters on e-trip to large employers in the Denver Metro North Front Range non-attainment area. We also sent out emails to 40 business organizations in the area, including cha chambers of commerce and economic development organizations. And uh, we've had quite a few uh, outreach meetings and presentations. So we presented on e-trip at at least 23 meetings thus far, in, including two meetings that are happening, this one and another one concurrently scheduled tonight. <laughs> and we have at least eight additional meetings scheduled in the coming weeks. <clears throat> in addition, we have a comment form for both eTrip and a separate proposal on transportation project um, planning that can be found on our greenhouse gas transportation webpage, which I will paste in, in the chat for this meeting. I'll highlight the web page at the end of this uh, presentation as well. You'll find the registration form for the um, upcoming stakeholder meeting on this web page, and we welcome all comments on each trip from any interested stakeholders, including those that may not be able to attend the stakeholder meeting. So, as we engage with stakeholders, the state will be working to develop and refine the concepts and framework for each trip into a more concrete proposal which will be informed by stakeholder feedback. Based on that, we plan to submit a request for hearing on our proposal to the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission or AQCC during the commission's scheduled meeting on May 20th and 21st of this year, since one of the agenda items for that meeting is for the commission to consider greenhouse gas reduction options for the transportation sector. If the request for hearing on that is granted by the AQCC, then the rulemaking for eTrip would occur during the commission's scheduled meeting on August 19th and 20th, 2021. It should be noted that between the request for hearing for rulemaking and the actual rulemaking itself, a rule proposal may get updated or undergo additional changes and parties to the rulemaking are able to participate in that process. Next slide. So next I'd like to give a broad overview of what an eTrip is. First, I want to reiterate <clears throat> that transportation demand efforts like eTrip are not a novel concept and have been successfully implemented as a mandatory program in a number of urban, suburban, and rural areas throughout the country since the 1980s. Out of these, there are, uh, <clears throat> there are at least 27 examples of state, county, or municipal eTrip requirements that have resulted in reduced SOV commute rates, including in places such as Alexandria, Virginia, Bellevue, Washington, the state of Massachusetts, Santa Cruz County, California, Washington, DC. The primary objective of eTrip is to reduce the rate of single occupancy or SOB commuting by employees to their work site. And it typically applies based on the number of employees at a work site. Looking at the employee thresholds in eTrips that have been adopted by other jurisdictions, we find <clears throat> that the threshold can range anywhere from 10 plus to 250 or more employees, though the most common threshold is 100 or more employees, which is currently the threshold that the state is considering for its eTrip proposal. That's also the threshold that's been um, recommended in EPA guidance on this. Finally, it should be noted that there are several transportation management associations or TMAs within the Denver Front Range area that already offer voluntary eTrip or commute reduction programs or assistance that employers have taken advantage of. So we are hoping to build off of that and um, to be able to utilize the existing resources and expertise to help with the implement implementation of eTrip. Next slide. So before I cover some of the options employers can in implement for eTrip, I wanna cover what eTrip is not <clears throat> to address some concerns or misconceptions there might be out there about it. First, eTrip is not a ban on commuting to perform work duties. eTrip is, is simply a way to rethink commuting options that can be beneficial to everyone. eTrip is not a one size fits all approach. What works for one employer may not work for another, even within the same area. We understand this and it is one of the things we are looking for feedback on in order to develop eTrip 
in a way that incentivizes commuter reductions no matter where an employer may be located or what the industry type is. E-trip is also another way to force commuters to over the carpools, transit, or bikes. E-trip does not require commuting to be done in a certain way at all. <clears throat> Rather, what we've seen with successful e-trip programs is that they incentivize employees to make their own decisions around commuting rather than just defaulting to driving alone. And it opens up options to having to commute at all. Lastly, e-trip has nothing to do with travel for other activities like shopping, taking kids to school, or for entertainment purposes. This is strictly about commuting to work, which is what the majority of us do on a regular basis, at least pre-pandemic. Next slide. So what will ETRIP require? <clears throat> First, employers subject to the ETRIP rule will have to identify a point person, also referred to as an employee transportation coordinator or ETC. And the ETC will develop and implement an ETRIP plan to achieve SOV reductions. ETRIP also requires annual surveys to as <clears throat> assess commuting modes and practices, as well as annual reporting. We are working with our partners building off of the RACS eTrip workgroup, such as the TMAs, um, to develop an eTrip toolkit for employers to use. <clears throat> and the timeline is as follows. First, um, a company will have to assign an ETC and complete the initial survey by mid-2020, develop and implement the plan, and submit the first report to the division by mid-2022, and then to achieve the initial reduction goal by mid-2023. Next slide. So again, along the lines of not being a one size fits all, there are a number of options employees can implement to achieve the ETRIP goal of reducing employee commute rates. Some of these options may work better for an office setting while others are suited for places of employment with workers that have to be on site <clears throat> with employees that, that work at, or with employees that work at different locations throughout the year. Some of these options can work regardless of the type of employer or work being done. So some of the options that can be implemented include telecommuting, flexible or alternative work schedules, offering public transit benefits or subsidies, ride sharing such as carpools and van pools, employee shuttles, parking management, and bike commuting services such as bike lockers, racks, storage units, showers, and a bike sharing program. We understand that not all of the options noted here may be entirely effective on their own in reducing SOV commuting, although some certainly will, such as telecommuting and van pools, for example. But the most important thing is that an employer actually develops and implements a plan that works best for them and their employees. And then they measure the progress against that plan and make updates or changes to it if, if need be to improve on that progress. We certainly understand that employers can't necessarily force employees to do certain things, at least in terms of how they may arrive at work, but there are ways to incentivize certain behaviors or disincentivize others and offer employees options to be active contributors in reaching the goals of an e-trip, which benefits everyone. We've seen this in our other jurisdictions that have implemented e-trips, and we believe it could work here as well. Next slide. So next, I'd like to provide a few examples of successful e-trip programs, including for an <clears throat> employer with essential in-person workers. These examples are based on uh, currently available information that we were able to find. And the first three examples are uh, local employers who, you know, there's not a mandatory program in Denver now, so they voluntarily implemented some of the types of e-trip measures discussed in this presentation. And as you can see, it resulted in impressive SOV reductions. I'll, dis <clears throat> excuse me. I'll discuss additional benefits of e-trips in the next slide. But another example is Seattle's Children's Hospital located in Seattle, Washington, which has numerous essential in-person workers. The hospital has over 5,000 employees and is located in a residential area that is not well served by buses or trains. The hospital's e-trip program includes a suite of <clears throat> transportation options, including transit subsidies, a shuttle system, on-site bicycle service center, bike parking, lockers and showers, 
vanpool priority parking, free commuter bikes, and guaranteed ride home. As a result of its e-trip, the hospital reduced its employer SOV commute rate from 73 to 33% and avoided construction of a $20 million parking garage, which was a significant cost savings. These types of e-trip programs can be tailored to a smaller or larger scale based on individual employer size, size or needs. Next slide, please. So in addition to the environmental and public health benefits of an e-trip, there are a number of other benefits that e-trip provides with the most obvious being a reduction in traffic congestion, which I think everyone can get behind. <laughs> but in addition to that, there are more specific benefits to employers and employees, including with increased competition and the need to build shareholder value, more pressure is being placed on businesses to lower their cost of doing business, as well as increase revenues and or margins. Strategies such as telecommuting and parking management can make a difference. Telecommuting can reduce office space requirements. Parking management can eliminate the need to build additional parking. Another benefit is enhanced employee, employee recruitment and retention. A shrinking labor force has increased competition for qualified candidates, which is especially noticeable in Colorado since it, since it has attracted well-educated and talented in, individuals from all over. Similarly, the cost of replacing employee and productivity and direct costs can be very expensive. An effective e-trip can help attract employees and keep them. Another benefit is expanded employee benefits at low or no cost. <clears throat> For example, employees can take advantage of changes in the federal uh, tax treatment of commute to work fringe benefits to benefit employees and reduce costs. Employers can now provide employees with a tax-free benefit and or offer to subtract the cost or transit um, cost of transit, van pool, or parking as a pre-tax payroll deduction option. An e-trip can also contribute to enhanced corporate image, which may also play into employee recruitment and retention. A number of employees are interested in working for an employer that demonstrates leadership and progress on addressing environmental issues. Additionally, employers with environmental image problems and their difficulties with their neighbors can seek to mitigate some of the problems using a combination of trip reduction strategies. Another be benefit of e-trip is lower employee absentee is, <coughs> excuse me, absenteeism and tardiness. Employees may make earlier time commitments to their carpool partner or to meet the bus to get to work. And telework allows for, for work to be accomplished when travel to the office is impossible. Reduced stress and improvement and improved health is another benefit. Employee health is significant, significantly related to the distance and duration of their commute trip. People who are exposed to greater levels of traffic congestion arrive at work with higher blood pressure than people who are not exposed to those conditions. Also, the more sensitive long distance commuters are to the effects of commuting on family life, the greater the inclination there is to try alternatives to solo driving. And for employees that may choose to bike to work, there are associated health benefits with that. Another benefit from e-trip is enhanced employee productivity. In fact, one of the most often cited benefits of telework is increased productivity. <clears throat> also, um, there are inc increased employment opportunities for the disabled and others and who are unable to meet traditional work hours. <clears throat> and that, you know, that also plays into equity considerations. So uh, telework provides an alternative for those kinds of employees, you know, to having to be physically transported to work. There are a number of other benefits of e-trip not noted here, but the point is, is that e-trip is not just good for the environment, but also good for employers and employees alike. Next slide. And Mr. Coffin, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So if you just cover this at a real high level for us to make sure we can get questions and comments in here. Okay. Yeah. Well, this, this is the last slide. So. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, you know, here's here's the website. Um, if there's, I can make sure the link is shared with you all. Um, but yeah, basically, if you go there, there's information about, you know, upcoming meeting, how to submit comments and participate in the process. And there's also a fact sheet. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions and comments. And so the first one is from Director Odorizio. 
Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Thank you. Um, I, the only comment is, I think this is, I think the objectives are outstanding. I think we need to move towards this, both for the uh, air quality and non-attainment issues, as well as just general efficiency of transportation. My only uh, request would be, as we go through this, that we don't um, penalize businesses that are not located in Denver because they don't have the infrastructure and the options that Denver central uh, businesses have. Uh, so as long, I think it's important for us to note that a lot of the outlying um, uh, suburban communities um, don't have the same infrastructure or all of the options that Denver has. And I just want to make sure that we don't um, uh, effectively penalize those folks who are investing in our uh, suburban areas. The other thing I would ask is just that we uh, keep in mind that we should be trying to help uh, support those businesses and folks uh, so it doesn't appear to be like an unfunded mandate that we actually provide resources. And it might mean that we have um, the state of Colorado invest more in our, our management, our transportation management groups that can help um, help us with the guidance and creation of programs uh, to help us reach these goals. Thank you so much, Director. Next up, we have Director William. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Richard, is there, we, we kind of, you kind of talked about this in relation to ozone standards. Is there a intention to kind of uh, make this a SIP commitment for our, our kind of increasing ozone standards? Uh, thanks for the question, Director Williams. And uh, it's a good question. And that's to be determined at this point, we're not considering that, but possibly in the future as yeah, as, as um, an area gets basically downgraded to, you know, worse attainment status, there are additional, poss potentially additional VMT offset requirements, but we still have to look at that. Thanks. Thank you so much. The next step is Director Levy. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions that I jotted down. I think one of them is a little bit related to Director Odorisio's question about uh, employers who aren't located in areas that are well served by transit um, and or bike pad improvements. And I, I know you listed a lot of options for compliance, but um, so I just, you know, I guess that and some of my other questions uh, go to the, the whole issue of enforcement and you know how how prescriptive is this going to be how are you going to enforce it could employers have an option of you know maybe paying into a fund in lieu if it, you know if their business is structured such that they can't find a way to comply you know, i and don't take my questions as not supportive of the goal but i'm you know i'm just thinking that there are a lot of employers that have a lot of different circumstances and many of them just may not have an opportunity to, um, <clears throat> you know, to adopt any of the policies that you're contemplating. Great, I'm not sure which one of you wants to take that, Mr. Clark or Mr. Coffin. Rick, do you want me to jump in on that one and maybe you can follow up if there's anything you wanna add? Sure. I, I think that's a great question and that's certainly something that we've considered and sort of, you know, talking about those issues. There is a sort of precedent in other jurisdictions with ETRIP programs for in lieu of compliance with the program or alternative compliance where you would pay into a fund. I will say that's not something that was uh, considered as part of the, the RAC proposal that we have built upon. I, I think when it comes to sort of the structure and how that would be enforced, really the intent is that the regulatory requirement upon the employer would be to come up with the plan, right? You, you know, Rick walked through those requirements, but it's essentially have a point of contact that is um, working with the state that would submit the plan on behalf of the employer to the state that sets out how that employer, based on whatever works best for that employer and their type of you know, business or organization and their employees, what would work best for them. And so the, the requirements or the regulatory requirement would be the plan that would deliver the reductions if utilized by the employees. Now, ultimately, if the employees did not utilize those options, that would not be a, a violation, if you will, by the employer. 
So it, it would really be about coming up with the plan that could get the, the reductions again, if utilized. Thank you, Jared. Just, that. Could I have just a quick follow up on that? Yes, um, please. I was just making sure it answered all your questions. I didn't think it might have. Go ahead. No, it, it, well, it, it didn't, but although it did actually partially answer the question about enforcement. So it's more important that they have a plan than that an employee actually participate and that they demonstrate reductions. You're wanting the plan. And, and that's, I guess, part of my follow up is um, you, you specified that they have to have um, an ETC. And it's, this seems like a great business opportunity for companies that would maybe want to um, get in the business of providing those services. So could a company outsource that and have a consultant that would do those things for them? Or are you being, you know, I guess at what level, at what level of, of specificity are you here in, in um, how they have to comply with this? It's, again, that's a good question and a good detail that we're looking into. I think as we have conceived it at this point, it wouldn't necessarily need to be done in-house. You're right that it could be done from an outside um, consultant or a TMA or you know whatever. You know, there's a lot of resources that that we would expect. You know, a lot of employers that may not have the you know in-house expertise to do that that would want to farm this out, and we would certainly be uh, wanting to recognize or the ability to use that. You know, as called out in the rules that would be developed and adopted by the Air Commission. Thank you very much. And Director Coombs, I just want to double check that your question was addressed. Yep, other folks asked it. Thank you very much. Director Walton. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I was curious if a program like this um, is an opportunity for an incentive or for a community to be competitive in some way in trying to attract new business. And if as a result, there could be conversations about this program early in a conversation before development and plans get really locked in so that perhaps even there could be incentives built in on decrease of parking spots and, um, and uh, different, you know, some of those kinds of things that could be considered or, you know, public improvements to regional, um, regional trails and things like that. Would you see that as an opportunity? And how, how would you plan to maybe engage real early in that process? <laughs> it, it is an interesting idea. And I think when we think about this in the big picture, that that's right, we have to think about how this fits in with sort of what else is going on with land use and local development and local governments and ordinances. So, you know, this rulemaking is, is part of actually a suite of transportation rules that will be considered by the Air Commission. Another one that's being considered goes to aspects of transportation planning. And I think, you know, some of those, those land use aspects and, you know, multi multiple considerations at the local level and how those would all dovetail in, I think will be sort of considered as part of that as well. So I, I think it is, it's an important um, consideration. And again, I think, you know, that idea of keeping the, the sort of the big picture in mind as we do that is, is important. So I, I appreciate those comments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all. Seeing no um, other questions, that ends our strategic informational briefing and takes us to the report of the chair. I have nothing to report, but I'll turn it over to the Performance and Engagement Committee for a report. Director Khan. My apologies to that. We did not meet, but uh, the committee could be looking forward to an exciting meeting in May. Great. And I will turn it over to the report of the Finance and Budget Committee. Director Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we had a, a very busy meeting with Finance and Budget. Uh, we elected Director Allison Coombs as the new vice chair for the committee. Uh, we approved a number of authorizations um, to allocate state and federal funds of approximately 681,000 to AAA contractors for the year ending June 30th, 2021 uh, to uh, contract with Department of Human Services for the AAA and to allocate and distribute up to 27 million in state and federal funds for the period of July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022 um, uh, for the executive director to negotiate and execute, uh, execute a contract with Sanborn Map Company 
in an amount not to exceed 250,000 for the period April 21 to September of 22. And uh, a, manages, a managed services agreement with OneNEC for support monitoring and maintenance for Dr. Cog's IT infrastructure for $130,000 for a one-year term with an option to renew for two years upon satisfactory performance. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. All right. Well, that takes us to our executive director's report. Mr. Rex. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, I know we have a full agenda today, tonight, so uh, I'll just um, mention three announcement reminders this evening. Uh, the first is the award celebration. If you haven't registered, please don't forget to do, uh, to, to do so. The event uh, will be held on uh, next Wednesday, April 28th, uh, starting at 1130. This is we're doing it over lunchtime this time. It's a virtual event, of course. And as you all know, this was an event that we had we had hoped um, to do in person last April, but to no avail for obvious reasons. Um, but this is quite frankly, this is a, a recognition, a long overdue recognition of the great people and, uh, and projects that have been done um, over the last, well, really quite frankly in 2019. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad we get an opportunity to, to recognize the great work that has been done. Um, so if you haven't registered, please do so. But if you have registered, we'll be sending out some additional instructions, including a code by email which will allow um, entry into the April 28th events. So stay tuned on that. Uh, let me see here. Uh, the next thing I wanna mention, um, if you also if you haven't registered, we have our, um, our third in the, in the series of our affordable housing series events scheduled for tomorrow at 10 o'clock. It's gonna run from 10 to noon. And the, um, the focus of this, this event will be um, the developer's perspective will share the challenges they face in the process from start to finish. And uh, they will also provide some insights into working with local government. So I'm sure you'll be, be interested to get their take and perspective on that. So please, if, uh, if, uh, if you can register, uh, that would be great. We got a, a lot of folks signed up for this event. Um, Flo and I were texting a little earlier today, so that's fantastic. But if you can't attend that event, don't fret. We, uh, we will be recording the event and we'll have the, um, we'll have the uh, workshop on our website. Last but not least, um, you should have all received notification via email about the Urban Land Institute uh, Technical Advisory Panels. Um, uh, we, you know, we're, we're you, ULI is soliciting applications for, for, these, for these panels. Um, and you, you may or may not know this, but Dr. Cox provides matching funds to lower the cost incurred by, by uh, the primary project sponsors. So if you're interested in this, please, uh, go to um, uh, ULI Colorado's website, or you can reach out to Brad Calvert on our staff and he'll set you in the right direction. The deadline is Friday, April 30th. Um, and I think if you were to speak to anybody that has done these panels in the past, I think they would tell you that they were very worthwhile endeavor and it provided some good information for, for the community. So with that, Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. Now up to 45 minutes is allocated for public comment and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting so that we'll be able to complete that public comment. I would request that there's no public comment on an issue where we held a prior public, public hearing. Um, consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. If there are any members of the public in the audience that would like to address the board, please raise your hand at this time. You'll find the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you've dialed in by phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. All right, seeing no members of the public that would care to comment this evening, that takes us to our consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, Kip. Second. I didn't see who seconded. Uh, Director Gipp said it. Uh, Director Odoricio seconded. Thank you very much. Um, any discussion on the motion of the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries. 
That takes us to our first action item tonight. We're going to um, have a discussion of a resolution of adopting the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. You'll hear it called the MVRTP. Jacob Rieker is our Manager of Transportation and Planning Operations, and he's going to take us through a presentation this evening. Good evening, Jacob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, give me just a moment to share my screen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, again, Jacob Rieger of Dr. Cog's staff, along with my colleague, Alvin Bedal Sanchez. Um, after almost two years of putting the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan together, uh, we are finally here tonight to ask for your uh, approval of the plan through resolution. And I'm gonna have my colleague, Alvin Bedal Sanchez, start us off, Alvin. Hey, Jacob. Good evening, board members. Uh, so we know many of you all have seen a variation of some of these slides before, so we'll just be quick. Wanted to give some final background and reminders of the item before y'all. The Regional Transportation Plan is one product that we develop as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. It's multimodal, so it covers all aspects of our transportation system, the different modes, components, impacts of our transportation system. It is fiscally constrained, so it's not a wish list of projects. The projects and programs we include in the plan, we think can be complete over the next 30 years with the revenue that's available. Like Jacob mentioned, we're wrapping up our update. We do an update like this every four years with all of our partners in the region. And we make sure to check some of our other requirements as the NPO when we're developing the RTP. One of those requirements is air quality conformity. The 2050 RTP has to address ozone, carbon monoxide, and PM10 pollutants. Air quality conformity is regional, so the entire MVRTP and TIP, it's not based on individual projects. It does look at the transportation networks that are included in our regional travel model. And the 2050 RTP did pass all of the pollutant emissions tests for the pollutants mentioned above. Every plan cycle is a little different, so we wanted to highlight a few of the key aspects of the 2050 plan process. There was a focus on regional priorities. Over the last two years and in some of our other planning processes, we've heard these priorities come up from the public and stakeholders repeatedly. So increasing safety, improving our air quality, providing more choices for people to get around the region, biking, walking, taking transit, and maintaining efficient freight movement. We also wanted to make sure we were balancing regional priorities with local context. We're a large region and we have a very diverse range of communities within the region. So making sure that there's flexibility within the plan for these investments to impact local context and local needs as appropriate. We also made some explicit programmatic investments addressing those priorities. So while we've always addressed safety and active transportation, for example, in previous RTPs, the 2050 RTP takes a further step and actually allocates some investment towards these types of projects over the next 30 years. We also had the most diverse list of project types that we included in the 2050 RTP based on our solicitation. And we had some significant public and stakeholder engage engagement utilizing two advisory committees, as well as our county transportation forums heavily that we didn't have in the previous plan cycle. Underlying all of the RTP work is the great planning work that's been done by Dr. Cog, local governments, CDOT RTD, as well as federal and state governments that's already occurred over the last couple of years. The RTP rolls up all of those visions and needs already established and begins to implement each of those. There's a lot of information in the plan ranging from a profile of the transportation system to some of the measures and outcomes that we look at to evaluate what impact investment is having in the region. Uh, we think it's our most readable and accessible RTP that we've ever developed. And for folk who wanna get into the nitty gritty, we do have 19 appendices to look at some of the methodologies, forecasts and analyses that underlie our 2050 assumptions. And I'll turn it back over to Jacob. Thank you, Alvin. So as Alvin mentioned, the themes that you see on the screen, the priorities really were the priorities that were identified through the planning process, whether it was from the public, from our stakeholders, um, from our committees, and even the board. Um, these six priorities really rose to the top. Uh, we've organized the plan document and we've organized the uh, investments in the plan around these six priorities. Um, one of our many appendices in the plan is a financial plan that goes into great detail about um, all of those revenues ex and expenditures over the 30 year planning period. Just as a reminder, um, this plan really is the region's long range transportation plan. It brings together all of the revenues and all of the expenditures, federal, state, local, um, you know, toll highway authorities, local governments, you know, everything that it takes to um, operate, maintain and invest in our multimodal transportation system over time. So this particular slide just gives you a sense of the financial plan in terms of how some of those dollars are allocated towards um, the priorities that we've talked about that are in the plan 
um, and that the plan is structured around. Um, and it also shows a map of some of the major projects uh, and the project investments in the plan. Um, we had a public comment period for the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan for the period that you see there from mid-February um, through mid-March. And as you'll remember, the public comment period culminated in a public hearing um, in front of the board on at your March meeting on March 17th. Um, we advertised the public comment period in the public hearing um, through a variety of methods that you see here um, to kind of get the word out um, in terms of getting a lot of engagement um, as we've had throughout the plan process, but particularly in the 30-day public comment period. And this slide actually gives you a sense of, you know, the level of engagement, which we were really, really pleased with. Uh, we received almost 300 comments, just sort of written, submitted comments. Um, we had a variety of tools, particularly given that we're in a pandemic, in terms of how people could engage on the, with the plan during the public comment period. So as you see, we had an on, on, online on-demand um, open house. We built a social pinpoint site uh, where people could come and comment. Um, they could do some online polling. They could um, interact with the plan at, at their level of comfort. Um, there was an interactive projects map. Um, we had virtual public meetings throughout the 30-day public comment period. Um, we virtually went around the region and gave as many presentations as we could. Um, so again, we really just wanted a, a variety of ways uh, that people could hear from us and people could reach us during the 30-day public comment period. Um, every meeting that we went to during the 30-day public comment period, we did some Mentimeter polling. Uh, we asked the questions that you see here. So this certainly isn't scientific, but we wanted to ask kind of a, a similar set of uh, you know, identical set of questions throughout um, the 30-day period, just to get the pulse of audiences we were presenting to in terms of um, how they were reacting to the plan, how they felt about the plan. Um, and along with sort of these numerical statistics, um, there was also a free response kind of section as part of that that we used to kind of draw out uh, some conversation and engagement um, at each meeting that we presented at. Um, in terms of the comments that we received during the 30-day public comment period, as I mentioned, we received almost 300 um, comments and written comments that were provided to us um, during the public comment period, as well as all the polling um, and everything else that we did and all the presentations that we made um, and everything else that everyone did during the 30 days. So it's really hard to sort of holistically and accurately kind of summarize all of that input um, given the breadth and the depth of the input that we received. So if you're interested, I really would encourage you to read Appendix C, uh, which is our engagement appendix. And it talks about, um, it shows all of the comments that we received. Um, I tried to break them out here just at really high level of three different groups of comments, but I, you know, I'd sort of summarize that even further in saying that uh, we either received comments of, you know, strongly held opinions from people um, who took time to share those with us, which we appreciated. Uh, we received a lot of questions. Um, request for clarification. So whatever the nature of the comment was that we received, um, we worked really hard to provide a substantive response, which is documented in Appendix C to all the comments we received. And then we um, also focused on making revisions to the plan, you know, that helped clarify some of the questions or answer some of the questions we received, clarify some of the comments that we got um, to try and make the plan just a little bit more clear uh, about our intent um, in terms of both the data, the methodology, uh, where we were going with the plan. So as we come to the motion, I want to end with a couple things. Um, first, our Transportation Advisory Committee and our Regional Transportation Committee um, both unanimously recommended approval um, of the plan. Um, since this is a transportation function of Dr. Cog, it's part of our Metropolitan Planning Organization function, uh, we do need the RTC motion and the board motion uh, to be identical. So we are looking for the motion that you see on the screen uh, to adopt to this plan. Finally, I wanna end with just a few thank yous. Um, first of Dr. Cog's staff, there was a whole team of folks um, and Dr. Cog that really put a lot of time um, into getting this plan together. Um, our local governments, all of you, and especially your staff, uh, put in a lot of time uh, and a lot of effort to help us get here. All of our stakeholders, CDOT, RTD, uh, RAC, uh, Toll Highway Authorities, everyone in the region, this really is the region's plan. Um, and there were a lot of people, a lot of organizations involved, and I wanna say thank you to all of them in particular, though, I'd like to, is we also had a consultant, I should mention, HDR, um, who helped us as well, and we really appreciate their help. Um, but I do want to end with thanking three of our Dr. Cog staff in particular, um, because without those three individuals, we wouldn't be where we are tonight. First, I want to thank Alvin Medal sanchez who you just heard from, uh, transportation planner on my team, who's only been here about a year, um, but came here and really jumped into this and really made this a much better plan. Lisa Hood, our public engagement specialist, 
She didn't just up our game on engagement, she completely transformed it. And I hope that's evident in the plan. And finally, Amber Lieberman, our communications manager and her team really took all of the raw content uh, that we provided and it was her team that really put together, um, produced and designed this beautiful document uh, that you have before you tonight. Uh, so I wanna thank her and her team as well. Um, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation and the, the appreciation you shared with those staff members as well as yourself really is very, very much to the accessibility of this document, the incorporation of public comments, the look and feel. Um, this is one of those times when it's really a shame that we're not meeting in person because I'm sure if we were, we would have the beautiful printed out copies and everybody could hold in their hand and be so proud of how this turned out. So I'm sure I'm sure we'll get back in person sometime, but this I can just imagine what it would be like with them sitting at our, our spaces down in the boardroom and being able to just appreciate what a amazing document you all have put together for us this evening. Are there any members of um, the board that would like to frame the discussion with a motion or any comments you'd like to make or questions you'd like to make? First up, we have Director Atkinson. I just plan to do the motion, Madam Chair. Please, thank you very much, sir. I would move to adopt a resolution adopting the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan in Associates with Dr. Cog, Colorado and PM 10 conformity determination in the Denver Southern sub area eight hour ozone conformity determination concurrently. Thank you, is there a second? Second. second. And, and it, that was identical to what happened at um, RTC, and I just will uh, correct again for the record that it's uh, carbon monoxide conformity, but the way we have it written on the slide is misleading. Is there any other question or discussion of the motion? All right, seeing none, uh, please unmute, and all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, the motion passes unanimously. That's fantastic, thank you very much. And that takes us to our next um, resolution this evening, which is uh, a discussion of a resolution adopting the 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program, the TIF. Todd Cottrell, our senior planner in transportation planning and operations, will take us through it. And you'll find it in your packet um, if you're following along that way in attachment E. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as we, get, as we begin, there's two documents as part of the discussion and recommendation this evening. Uh, the 22 to 25 transportation improvement program and the two air quality uh, conformity determinations. Uh, note that these air quality documents are the ex exact same documents that you just had within your last item. So what is a TIP? Uh, the TIP is a short-term planning program that identifies the real transportation projects with fiscally constrained federal and state funding. So in other words, as where the RTP would list these projects and programs anticipated with reasonably expected funds over a 20 to 30 year period. The TIP is programmed with known funding or as well known as possible over the next four. So per federal law, uh, TIPs must be created at least every four years, uh, though Dr. Cog does develop and adopt a new TIP every two years. So every other cycle, new Dr. Cog projects are selected through calls for projects. Uh, for this TIP, the 22 to 25 cycle, no new projects were selected. Uh, TIPs are required to contain certain elements, uh, including the ones that you'll see on this slide and the next. Uh, so these include uh, fiscal constraint, where the financial plan must show and that the anticipated revenues over this four-year period are equal to or greater or yeah, greater than the project level expenses. Uh, it also looks at environmental justice concerns. Uh, so the TIP reviews the projects against locations with a higher than regional average of minority and low income communities. Uh, this analysis completed for this TIP shows no disproportionate impacts on the environmental justice communities. For performance measures, um, this reports on the progress towards achieving set goals on key transportation measures. Um, and these include the measures that you'll see on your screen here. Uh, for conformity finding. So Elvin covered this information in your last presentation. So I won't rehash what he's already mentioned, uh, really just except to say that all the required budgets were passed. Uh, it's also required to include project descriptions. Uh, so this is a key piece of information uh, for each project um, that is outlined within the TIP. This includes such in, uh, items such as the project scope, project cost by year, and of course the project location. Uh, and finally, uh, public involvement. 
So the TIP is required to hold a minimum 30 day public comment period. Uh, these documents were released for comment on February 10th um, with a comment period that concluded at your last board meeting with the public hearing. Uh, so the agenda packet before you includes both the comments received and project changes that have happened since the public hearing version of the TIP document. So that concludes uh, the presentation that I have for you this evening. I'd be happy to take any comments or questions you may, yet you may have. Um, important to note that both the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee have recommended approval. Uh, so the recommended, uh, the requested motion before you this evening is to approve the 22 to 25 Transportation Improvement Program and the associated air quality documents. Thank you very much for that great presentation. Mr. Cottrell, are there any questions, comments, or motions to frame the discussion from members? Not seeing any hands jumping up for questions or comments. I know we all are very engaged on the tip because it's how we help fund our important transportation projects in the region. So with no questions, could I please get a motion? Director Brockett. Uh, yes, I'll go ahead and uh, move that we approve the 2022 to 2025 associated air quality determination documents. I second. Um, thank you. I just didn't note down who the second one. Sorry about that. Was it Mayor Starker? Mayor Starker, thank you. Thank you. And um, Director Maurer, did you have a comment? No, I was just going to second. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Maurer, for raising your hand. I appreciate that. Um, any other discussion of the motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. And that takes us to our next agenda item, which is very closely related to the discussion of the transportation improvement program. Uh, but now we'll be talking about the waiting list and uh, funding distribution. So Todd Cottrell will take us through that as well. Todd? Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, so before I begin, I, I certainly would like to thank everyone involved in this process up front. Uh, you know, for the large time and effort that it took to get through this process, uh, especially those who participated within their individual forums. Um, to my knowledge, this has been one of the largest and probably most complicated non-call for project undertakings that we've taken that we've taken that really involves the TIP process. So if you recall, uh, approximately a year ago, uh, we started the waiting list process, but then halted this uh, process due to to COVID and to really deal with the impacts that it had within the existing TIP projects. But the overall steps for the waiting list process uh, involve one, uh, splitting the available funding that we do have to available projects according to how it's outlined in the TIP policy, uh, to advance existing project funding, uh, then of course to select brand new projects. So for this call, or I mean, sorry, for this waiting list process, uh, Dr. Cog had a total of just under uh, $55.8 million available, uh, approximately $19.5 million of that, that was a mix of the normal funding types that Dr. Cog typically has, and $36.2 million of that was COVID STBG money, or surface transportation block grant. So this COVID funding came as part of the bill the president signed in late uh, 2020, of which portions of it were allocated to MPOs. So this COVID funding acts like regular STBG funding, with two major exceptions. Uh, first, it must be spent by the end of federal fiscal year 24, and second can be used at up to 100% federal, uh, therefore requiring no match. So um, through additional CDOT recommendation and discussions, uh, it was decided that this funding would go towards construction projects that can either advertise in federal fiscal year 21 or 22. Um, if you take a look at attachment one, that shows the breakdown of the funding by subregions. Uh, regarding the actual individual waiting lists. Uh, so Dr. Cox staff began this process by talking to the first sponsor off of each waiting list and simply asking them if they wish to accept the available funding. Uh, attachment two in your packet includes each current waiting list and the TIP policy protocols, which outlines this process. So as Dr. Cog had discussions with these individual sponsors and as they responded, um, staff kept moving down their individual waiting list. And so if a sponsor declined their funding, uh, that project remained on their list. Uh, and if they accepted, they were bound to complete that project scope with the local match rates that they had submitted within their application. Then that project was removed from their list. 
So essentially overall, the decision to accept funding from the waiting list is essentially the sponsor's decision and really doesn't involve a sub-regional forum, um, whether through discussions or a final recommendation. Uh, however, we did reach out to the forums and seek their involvement uh, for a discussion and recommendation uh, based on two key items. Um, one, since this COVID funding match rate could be used at up to 100% federal, um, each forum needed to discuss and recommend if they wish to have any projects uh, be awarded this funding without providing that local match on any eligible projects. Um, it certainly was also possible to combine the COVID funding with the existing funding sources uh, to fund projects where maybe the overall match rate was actually less than required 20% match. The other key item for requesting forum discussions uh, was that most of the forum waiting lists had either only a few projects on their list or their targeted amount of, of funding to program was greater than the projects they actually had on their list in the first place. So in these situations, uh, staff offered potential solutions, you know, including recommending brand new projects and or adding additional Dr. Cog funding to a, uh, the existing projects. I'll also uh, note that many of the options um, that, that were recommended by the forums are sort of either against the actual TIP policy or involve situations where the policy is silent. So in those cases, I'll be pointing out those um, over the next few slides, and this will be part of your action this evening. So the next several slides outline the actual forum recommendations and if any variances were requested. So for the regional share, uh, Denver had the first project on the list, their Broadway I-25 project, at an amount that exceeded the target amount. Uh, they accepted the funding for the, the lower amount. The other two projects on the list were either funded through the subregional process or were funded locally. For the Adams County subregion, uh, North Glen had the first project on the waiting list and accepted $2 million of their forum target amount. The next two projects, which belong to the city of Aurora, declined their funding and those two projects will remain on their list. Um, so with the remaining balance of $4.6 million, uh, the forum recommended to apply the COVID funding to a portion of the Bennett project and then apply the remaining unallocated funds proportionally to the other projects to reduce their local match. So this is the first subregion where uh, we come across a variance that is requested. Uh, and this variance is requested to add additional TIP funding to these existing projects. For the Arapahoe County subregion, uh, the only project sponsor to accept funding from the list was Littleton for, the, for a study along Broadway uh, with the remaining unallocated target of $7.3 million. Uh, the recommendation was to lower their existing project match rates on existing projects. Uh, a variance would also be requested for this subregion. Um, it's to the same as the last is to add additional tip funding to these additional projects. For Boulder County, um, they were able to fund a majority of the projects on their list, uh, leaving a remaining unallocated balance of 188,000. Uh, the forum recommendation was applied to this amount, was to apply this amount to one of the Lions projects. Uh, in addition, the COVID funding at 100% was applied to both the Lions projects, reducing their local matches below 20%. Uh, in addition, a variance was requested to add the unallocated funds of 188,000 to one of the newly funded Lions projects. Uh, both Broomfield and Denver had similar situations where Broomfield was able to fund one of their two remaining uh, waiting list projects. Uh, and with Denver, they were able to fund two projects, one fully and one partially. Uh, the next is for the Douglas subregion. Uh, Castle Rock had the first project on their list and was able to allocate three and a half million dollars of their original request. Uh, each of the remaining three projects uh, declined the funding uh, and this left an unallocated, unallocated balance of 699,000. Uh, that remaining balance was added to three existing projects to reduce their, their overall match. Uh, another variance is requested for the Douglas subregion uh, to add TIP funding to these existing projects. For Jefferson County, um, the county itself had the only project on the waiting list in which they declined funding. Uh, the forum recommendation is to fund two new TIP projects and then also add TIP funding to an existing uh, 
Wheat Ridge project on Wadsworth Boulevard. Uh, in addition, it should be noted that the forum proactively recommended changes to a couple of Wheat Ridge projects, uh, which included a transfer of funding from their Ward Road project to their project on Wadsworth. Um, this project will take place in the future only if and when um, they decide to cancel their project on Ward Road. And if this action does take place, it will show up in a future TIP uh, amendment. So the TIP policy variation requested uh, is threefold. Um, the first is to select two new projects for funding. The second would be to add TIP funding to the existing Wheat Ridge Wadsworth project. And third would be to allow potential future transfer of funds between the Ward Road project and the Wadsworth project. For the Southwest Weld subregion, uh, both projects off their waiting list were funded. Uh, in addition to allocating the COVID funding at 80% to two existing projects. And of course, we finished up the recommendations um, just by some additional um, swapping out of funds to balance everything out. So next steps. Uh, so now that some of these waiting lists are pretty well depleted, uh, staff is requesting approval to issue a new call for projects. So attachment four within your agenda pack, packet contains the adjusted waiting lists as they will look after this action is taken on this item. Uh, this will help us prepare for situations that if additional funds do come into the region before we get to uh, federal fiscal year 23, where according to the TIP policy, uh, any new funding after that time would just simply roll over into the next call covering the years 24 through 27. Uh, this is especially important as we get down um, into the further discussions, not only in Washington, but on the state level, uh, including on transportation funding. Uh, it's important to point out that this call will not be associated with any new uh, transportation funding. Uh, it's simply just to increase the projects on the now adjusted waiting list. Uh, staff is proposing that any projects selected from this call be placed on their individual waiting list after the existing projects that are already on the list in score order. In addition, uh, we're also anticipating holding both the regional call and the sub-regional calls at the same time, using the existing applications that we have for the 20 to 23 cycles. Um, at this time, staff is proposing to score the applications, then we'll convene a scoring panel to validate those scores. We're also still working through ways to restrict sponsors of taking advantage of submitting you know, perhaps lower scoring projects just to get them onto the waiting list. Uh, possible solutions include, you know, restricting the number of applications by forum or even not allowing some of the forums to submit applications, certainly depending on the total funding amount their list currently has. Uh, and finally, we're, we're crossing fingers that we can be able to release this call this coming Monday um, in closing on June 21st. Um, given these dates, we would certainly expect to bring an action back to the board, most likely in September. So with that, that brings us to the motion, um, your recommended action, action for this evening. Uh, there is quite a lengthy uh, number of items that we've tagged onto this, but it completes all the necessary steps for this uh, motion and action to take place. So it's moved to approve the following actions to allocate the available funding to projects in the 22 to 25 tip. This includes projects and funding changes as outlined in attachment three, uh, the TIP policy variances that were outlined in, within the memo, the adjustments to the waiting list as outlined in attachment four, to issue a new call for projects, to select projects for individual waiting lists, and of course, to administratively, administratively modify the 22 to 25 TIP. I'll also note the that uh, both TAC and RTC have recommended approval and be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mayor Atchison. Again, not a, not a question, but I was gonna make the motion, but I was gonna save a lot of repeat by just saying I move exactly as Todd read it. Perfect, is there a second to frame the conversation? Second. No, thank you. You, and I think that was Director Gick. Nope, just Director guessing Dale. wrong. Thank you, Director Dale. Sorry, I try to pay attention to all your microphones, but I've got too many screens open. And so um, 
I see Director Levy, um, you put your hand down. I just want to make sure that you didn't have any questions or comments. No, I was going to second. All right, thank you very much. Um, so Dr Executive Director Rex. Madam Chair, if I may, just real quick, I, I just want, I hope everybody understands what a monumental task this was to try to get, um, you know, all these projects up and going. And I really, truly, obviously want to stay, thank staff for the tremendous lift, but I want to thank the directors for your, your diligence and flexibility and willingness to meet on a moment's notice to, in the, in the sub-regional forums, because quite frankly, I don't think we could have done it without the sub-regional forums. And, and just because, you know, we didn't have, there were, you know, because of you know the time frames in which we had to spend this money, we had to be a little innovative in how we did it too. So again, thank you all very very much, and it just just proves um, you know what with you know the true value of this regional collaborative. So thank you. Thank you, Executive Director X, Director Levy. Uh, yes, I now I do have my hand up to to speak. Um, actually, because this is my first time through this cycle and. Uh, participating in actually Boulder chairs, Boulder County chairs, our sub-regional forum. And it was really a great process. And our staff and staff from the jurisdictions within Boulder County worked so well together. And, uh, and so it was just great to be able to work through our list and then be able to allocate that final $188,000 to the town of Lyons. So um, I also commend staff on a great job putting this together. And it was just a really rewarding process for us. Thank you. Director Brockett. Yeah, I also wanted to add my thanks to, to staff and the congratulations that this was a tough process uh, um, in, in a good way, right? Like uh, extra money is always nice to get, um, but there was a lot to allocate quickly and you all did a phenomenal job. And our sub-regional format that worked really well together in part because of staff's hard work and I'm sure the others were uh, similar. So, uh, and I also appreciate your flexibility. You know, we didn't follow tip policy exactly, but these were extraordinary circumstances. So. I thought it was very judicious the way you handled it all. So thanks very much. Thank you everyone for those great comments. And um, just please, if, if um, you are new, just remember that we've also in this uh, discussion talked about a new call for projects so that we repopulate the waiting list in anticipation of future federal funds. So make sure you go back and talk with your staff about getting projects ready to submit to that process. And if you have any questions, just look around the region to um, somebody who's been on Dr. Cog longer and just don't hesitate to call each other and talk about it and figure out the best path forward because if we work together, we can get really great projects done. And seeing no other hands, I will ask those in favor to please say aye. 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 Any, oppo any opposed? Thank you everyone, the motion carries unanimously. And that takes us to the discussion of our state legislative issues. So we'll take this in two parts. Um, we'll first go through the bills on positions that have previously been taken and we'll kind of get any updates we need to there. And then we'll take up new bills for consideration and action. And just a reminder that um, we need two thirds of the members that are present and voting on this section of the agenda to, to take a position on a legislative item because of our bylaws. And so um, we've taken account of the attendance and there are 37 directors here and just each jurisdiction only gets one vote. So even if there's a member and alternate present, we've taken that into account. And um, so we'll have to ask people if they're abstaining so we can subtract those out from the 37 and they get, get a count to the two thirds. So I just wanted everybody to know the process so nobody felt surprised when that part comes up. And with that, I will turn it over to Rich Morrow to, to introduce our um, topics. Thank you, Madam Chair. And can everybody hear me? We and can hear you. I don't know if you can see me yet, but <laughs> we'll get started. Um, and thank you, I, and I think you you said most of what I was planning to say, so we're good. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, mention first that what I'd like to do before getting into the bills is ask Ed Bowditch, um, one of our contract lobbyists, to just give a brief update on the budget. Um, the long bill is moving through the legislative process right now, and uh, when Ed is done, then I will jump into the uh, bill list. Ed, go ahead. Thank you, Rich. Good evening, Madam Chair and members. Um, the state's budget bill uh, was uh, introduced earlier this month. It has passed the Senate and the House. 
It will be in conference committee starting next week, and we expect it to be set off to the governor at that time, the end of next week. The long bill this year totals approximately uh -oh. 13 is the general fund. That's where all action is, if you will. Priorities this year for the Legislative Joint Budget Committee. Um, one of them was restoration of funds. You remember a year ago after the COVID shutdown, um, there was all sorts of budget cutting. The legislature had to cut virtually anything it could. Um, turns out the budget wasn't quite as bad as they thought. In effect, they overcut. So they wanted to restore some of the funds. They restored some of the programs in human services. They restored the state funding cuts to K-12 education and to higher education. Um, our big issue with the budget is the state funding for senior services. Um, in our last full year, fiscal year 20, we were getting 14.8 million of general fund. That went down to 11.8 million this year. The governor's proposal was to drop it down to 7 million, but in the end, after intensive lobbying with all the JBC members and working with some of the other um, senior organizations, we got it back up to the 14.5 million dollar level. So we were almost back to full funding, if you will. Um, that's just the general fund. The other funds uh, allowed us to maintain the total senior funding for um, all state funding for senior services at 28.5 million for next year. Um, for the, um, the other big priority for the Legislative Budget Committee um, is planning for the next downturn. Um, to, to kind of address that, the Budget Committee has a goal of increasing the state's reserve. This year, the state's general fund reserve, in effect, the rainy day fund is down slightly below 3% of appropriations. For next year, the goal is to get it close to 14%, maybe more 13.5, but that is the largest it's ever been in the 30 some years I've been at the Capitol. Um, and that would really go a long way towards helping them the next time we get a uh, budget downturn. Um, two other issues, um, the state stimulus programs, um, the state had a bunch of one-time monies. In effect, the, the money they cut too much out of this year's budget so they have various bills going through providing state stimulus, trying to get the economy jump started, if you will, using a one-time infusion of state dollars. Um, a number of those bills are going through the process. The big one, however, is the federal stimulus dollars. Um, for the American Rescue Plan, the state of Colorado is supposed to receive about $3.95 billion. Um, a number of that uh, would go to counties, some to the cities, and smaller towns as well. But that's a lot of money. Right now, there are negotiations going on between the legislative leadership and the governor's office, um, particularly about who gets to decide how to spend those monies. Typically, federal funds, if they're not a required match, are spent by the governor's office. But of course, the legislature wants to have input into that. Um, that issue will not be de not be decided in the next couple of weeks. I imagine it will uh, uh, it will take longer than that. Um, the budget cycle is a fluid cycle. We're in the current year budget. We're planning for the next year's budget, and Rich and Jennifer and I, along with other folks at Dr. Cog, are already planning for the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Um, we're already talking, and Rich coordinates with all the other AAA's and senior organizations about what do we do about particularly state funding for senior services for 22-23. In the past, we've been successful at getting, when the budget's been had a little flexibility, getting $3 million general fund increases. That's one option as we look towards the 22-23 um, budget, but the planning for that starts in the next couple of weeks. Um, that's my general overview of the long bill. I'm happy to take questions or turn it back to Rich. Any questions to this point from members? All right, thank you for that great presentation. Rich, take it away. Okay, so um, if you go to, if you're at uh, your attachment G, we have the uh, uh, 
status of bills previously acted by the board. I'm, I, I'm not intending to go through them in any detail, uh, largely because um, not anything significantly has changed uh, substantively on the bills other than moving through the process. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll just see if, the, if anyone on the board has any questions um, about any of the bills. So for the bills, so for the bills we've taken the positions on, um, right. we'll we'll just consider yeah. if there are questions from members at this time, and otherwise we will just not change the positions that we've already discussed. All right, seeing no questions there, we'll move on to the new bills. So the new bills, then I think we have three of them, and that will take you to let me get to it. Um, attachment H. And Lisa or Melinda, would you be able to put attachment H up on the screen for folks to be able to see for us? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first bill, um, we have two aging bills and one transportation bill. The first bill is House Bill 1227. Uh, it's titled uh, uh, Nursing Home Demonstration of Need. And it's a bill by the uh, Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing to uh, revise and update uh, an existing statute uh, to require uh, more detailed demonstration from uh, nursing home companies that want to build a facility um, with anywhere in the state that they go through a, a detailed process of um, meeting various requirements to demonstrate to the, to the state that um, uh, there is a need for more uh, nursing home beds in that area. And um, that bill um, is um, scheduled. It's actually gone through the house already. Um, it's one of those bills that got introduced shortly after our last board meeting. Um, but it definitely is, since we have the ombudsman program, it's definitely of interest to us. And it's scheduled for its first hearing in the Senate Finance Committee um, next Thursday. So, um, we would um, like to monitor this, this bill at this point um, to uh, continue to, to make sure that uh, um, the bill stays in a position that is um, supportive to us, but we, don't, we just wanna make sure that, that you know, nothing goes south on it at this point. Um, and, and, and Madam Chair, do you wanna uh, take motion on these? Yeah, we'll do these one at a time. Them. We could do it one at a time. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll discuss this one at this time. Does anyone have any concern with taking a position of monitor as the recommended position? And it's okay if you do. I wasn't trying to single people out with a, with a concern, but I just thought that might be the fastest way to cut to the chase. All right, seeing none, um, we will take a position of monitor if that's acceptable to everyone. So if I could just get a motion to support a position of monitor. I'll so move. Thank you, Director Flynn. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Director Olson. Seconded that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. We'll take a position of monitor on that bill. Thank you. Um, the next bill is actually kind of an interesting one. I didn't even know this program existed until this bill was introduced. Um, there's a, a program in the Department of Public Health and Environment uh, that's been dubbed the uh, Health Disparities Grant Program, and they're uh, um, and it, they're amending it in a couple of different ways, basically to expand the uh, opportunities for grants to community-based organizations, and um, also. Um, they're going to set up a work group to develop a, a strategic plan on uh, equity and health disparities. And um, I did notice that the uh, existing statute for the existing program does refer to an aging population in the definition of health disparities. And so I thought that in particular, since this is, looks like it's going to be opening up uh, possible grant opportunities to community-based organizations, um, this is something that we should support and it could provide some, some opportunities to further 
our work in the Denver metro area. So I would, uh, on, on, on that basis, recommend to the board a uh, position of support for the bill. Thank you for that explanation. Is there any discussion of this bill from members? <laughs> Director Starker. Madam Chair, I move a position of support on this piece of legislation. Thank you, and Director Flynn. Thank you, uh, I'll second it, but I was also going to comment. Great, thank you very much. May I comment now then? That would be great. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, this is something ordinarily that I think um, we would very strongly support, but we have not had a discussion on it yet at our staff level, either with the administration or with our council committee that meets collaboratively collaboratively with the administration. So um, I'm going to abstain on it, uh, regrettably. I'll vote yes on it next month. Thank you very much, Director Flynn. Any other comments on uh, or discussion of this bill? All right, seeing no other discussion, all those of, in favor of a position of support, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And if it's not too much to ask any abstentions, if you could raise your hand by clicking the raise hand feature at the bottom of your panel. All right. Just giving everybody a second and then making sure I do my math right. I'm gonna do it three times just to be sure. I believe that's absolutely just fine. I just wanna double check. Seven. Oh, we added another one. Okay, we are good. The motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. And if you could put your hands down, just in case we need to do that exercise again. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. And that takes us to, so we'll take a position of support on that bill. And that brings us to the next bill for discussion. So, so the next one, I imagine, all of you have strong interest in and um, opinions on. And so the, I think uh, this is the one that would uh, establish uh, the Front Range Passenger Rail District. And um, there's a lot more details in that. I'm sure you, you may or may not wanna get into, but um, because of, I think, the broad interest in this bill, we decided to just put, place it on the agenda here for uh, board direction and rather than making a staff recommendation. So would like to open it up um, for your uh, preference on this. Um, I'm sorry, Rich, I was making a spreadsheet so it would go easier all right. on this yeah, topic. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so, this is on the passenger rail bill and um, we're just asking for board direction on this. So we'd like to uh, have you tell us what position you'd like Dr. Cox. Thank you very much. And so sure. leading off, as you as you anticipated, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, yeah. and, and so people's hands are popping up. And so I'll go through the queue in the order the hands were raised. And we'll start off with Mayor Atchison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, we've all been looking for ways to include and increase our participation in transportation. But at the present time, we're looking at multiple transportation bills. The bill that was introduced by Matt Gray and Faith Winter and uh, both sides is a large bill looking at funding options for transportation for the entire state. We currently have a number of issues going on with a transportation district being RTD and the uh, availability of funding and growth of transit there. There's a, also a lot of conversation now starting to look at what's gonna happen to the transportation bill that's being proposed by the legislature if we take and put another taxing district, especially one this size, on top of the district that's already paying transportation taxes but is not getting service, that is a concern I have of how much of this is gonna to get to the point where we have tax upon tax upon tax, but we're not getting service. From my standpoint, I'm not ready to make a commitment on the support or denial of 238 there's a lot of conversation that's still going on among Metro mayors through our transportation group and stuff about what the real impact of this would be to the potential of getting transportation through the legislature this year. So I, from my standpoint, I will be an abstain when it comes to that point. 
Thank you, Director Acheson. Next in the queue is Director Peck. Thank you, uh, Chair Stoltzman. Um, at our council meeting, we voted to take to ask uh, the supporters of this bill or the authors of this bill to table it. We think it is premature. Uh, we do not know if there's going to be any federal funding for this project as of yet. And without that federal funding, there probably won't be a project. Um, we felt that the tax that they were going to put on this district uh, was indeterminate at this time to put any kind of a tax uh, is very premature. So uh, we are going to, if it comes back up, we're just going to monitor it. But we did ask that it be tabled. Thank you. Thank you, Director Peck. Director Levy. Uh, thank you. I think our uh, comments from Boulder County are a little somewhat similar to those from Director Peck of Longmont. Um, I, I think at this point, I would recommend Dr. Cog just take a position of monitor. I think the bill also is, uh, or I should say we on behalf of Boulder County think the bill is really premature. There's no funding source available at this point to fund a front range passenger rail that's been identified yet the district would be created and would be in effect. And so while it's been talked about as a mechanism to demonstrate good faith and the ability of uh, the state of Colorado um, and affected areas to come up with funding as an inducement to Amtrak and uh, to fund front range passenger rail, there's nothing in the bill that would make the creation of the district and the function of the district contingent on that. And in fact, the bill actually provides full authorization for this district to, uh, to tax, um, create, fund, operate, maintain, construct uh, a railroad, a passenger rail up and down. And so we feel that this is really an open-ended uh, commitment that is being taken on. And we would really love to see this bill just wait until we know whether there's um, any funding available. We're also concerned in Boulder County, unsurprisingly, because we're, we haven't seen RTD follow through on Northwest Rail that we could end up being taxed again for a, a train that might not come to Boulder. Uh, because the alignment is up in the air and it would be up to this district um, to determine that alignment. Uh, Dr. Cog, as I read the bill, uh, the entirety of Dr. Cog gets exactly three seats on what I believe is a 14 member board. So we, we have serious problems with the bill. I don't know that we're ready to say um, that we don't support it. Uh, we're uh, in a position where we have a lot of questions and we need to see a lot of changes to the bill if, if we are going to support it. Thank you, Director Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I actually would like to just echo what Director Levy just said about representation and just certainly um, Denver specific concern that, you know, being certainly one of the anchor communities to, to this type of service, not seeing, you know, Denver County having representation on this board. And uh, yes, yeah, Director Levy said, Dr. Cog, the Dr. Cog region only having three representatives uh, for this expansive of a region with this high volume, you know, I, I think we have, we have strong concerns. I think generally we, we support front range rail uh, on that, but really would want to express our concerns about the representation as it's currently written in the bill. Thank you, Director Williams. Director Coombs. Um, yeah, so I 100% support having front range rail. I think it's an important investment that we have to make um, in our future in reducing our impact on transportation, on traffic, on everything that we're trying to do. Um, unfortunately, I will have to abstain because Aurora has not had an opportunity to discuss this bill yet. Thank you, Director Coombs. Director Mulvey? Hi, yeah, the concerns we have are a little bit unique because the quarter alignment hasn't been done and um, the taxation isn't quite clear. So we would advocate a monitor at this one. It's a little bit um, premature to really ascertain how we would deal with it. The corridor would either go directly through our city or to the edge of it. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Director Odoricio? 
Uh, it sounds like a lot of folks are in, all in the same boat that we kind of need to sit back and watch or and or determine where our respective organizations are. So I would recommend that we either monitor or not take a position tonight. That's my recommendation. Thank you, Director Odoricio. Director Brockett. Yeah, and uh, we talked this over some of the city builder. Of course, we're very interested in seeing front range passenger rail in general. And the hope for us would be that it would be along the Northwest Trail alignment and finally get that project done. But we do have concerns given that the alignment is not specified um, and also about concerns about the double taxation for service that hasn't been delivered as some other directors have mentioned. Um, but we, we do want Dr. Cog to take an active role in at least uh, determining the answers to the questions about where is this going and, and how might Dr. Cog play a role. So I, I would recommend a, a monitor position for us and, and ask that uh, our lobbyists and our staff, um, you know, stay at the table, get the answers to all the questions and, and potentially we take a more active position later on in the session as we learn more. Director Maurer. Um, yeah, for the city of Centennial, um, we haven't had a lot of discussions about this just because there's been so many questions and, and how the taxation would happen. But uh, yeah, I would have to abstain as well. Thank you, Director Maurer. Director Dick. Thank you. Yeah, I would just uh, uh, reiterate what a lot of everybody said. Uh, Mayor Ashton obviously brought up the double taxation issue and all of my Boulder cohorts kind of uh, are in line with exactly what our thinking is at this time. And so we definitely would want to see more information, but I think a monitor and uh, keep our lobbyists on top of this would probably be very beneficial for all of us. Thank you everybody for the great discussion so far. I have a couple questions for the lobbyists. Um, just what do you think the timing will be? Will we, will we have another board meeting before you think this bill gets heard? So we won't meet again as a board to take action for a month. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Ed or Jen can jump in on this as well. Um, I, I think I would not be surprised since our next board meetings, you know, a month away that the bill would at least have a hearing in its first committee, uh, by that time. Um, but I don't have any insight or specific information as to, to how quickly it, it may be moving. It looks like Ed might want to fill us in on a little bit more. Great. Um, slightly more information. It is scheduled yep. for next week. I can't remember which really day. Okay. That's its, its first hearing. Okay. Um, and so it sounds like there's a lot of interest in making some changes to the structure of the bill. So I wonder if the group would want to um, clearly articulate what some of those changes we would want our lobbyists to focus on. I understand people may not be prepared this evening to take a position of support or oppose, but it did sound like there was some um, agreement from many people who spoke around changing some of, at least articulating some concerns around forming the taxation district at this time, around um, the alignment of the rail and around representation um, and not having enough representation for our populace in our area. Um, so I don't know if members would wanna, would wanna uh, sort of get behind, you know, working on those topic areas and making it clear. It sounded like everybody said there's support for front range passenger rail, but we care about the details. We care if we're taxed twice. We care about the alignment. And so um, this might not just be quite right for us. So I just put that out there. I could have been way off in listening to you all. And so I look forward to finding out what we should do. Director Brockett. Yeah, thanks for that, Director Stolzman. Um, I guess what, one question would be, I, I guess the, this bill is coming forward in the hopes of establishing a group that could then negotiate with federal government and form some kind of partnership with Amtrak to get those federal funds to make this happen. One question would be, could we establish um, such a district and a board but not grant them taxing authority initially, um, which I think is what a lot of the concerns come around. So would, be able, would we be able to stand up something official that could negotiate but hold off on granting them taxing authority until the proposals had come forward more. So that would be a question that would be interesting to know the answer to. Thank you, Director Brockett. And I'm not sure, I think you were posing that as a question for the lobbyists to ask and to flesh out right. over time, not looking for an answer tonight, correct? That's right, yes. Just making sure there. Thank you, Director Brockett. Director Mulvey. Yeah, I, I'd like to um, propose, not that we're asking per se for the lobbyists to look for modifications because I'm not sure that you know we're really looking at modifications per se, but rather to 
see whether this is um, something that would proceed at the right time in the right place because I'm, I'm not sure that the things that have been raised are things that would be changed in the bill. It either is or it isn't. And the alignment either is or it isn't. And, and that's the concern that I, that I heard personally. So that's, that's why I was suggesting monitor or no position. Um, I mean, I didn't suggest no position before, but I'm suggesting it now. I'm, I'm not sure that suggesting direction or modifications would satisfy what, what I heard or what I've um, articulated. Director Mulvey, and I, I just might be hearing poorly tonight. So just if you could clarify, would you be in favor of requesting that they table it until a later time when more of these things are known? Because if we just monitor it, then we're not taking any, our lobbyists are then not doing anything on this at all. I mean, they're monitoring it and they're, they're working for us toward our policies that we've laid out and they're listening to this discussion here. So I said that totally wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I, I apologize. I dropped my microphone. That's my bad. So I'm, I'm just going to re repeat what I was trying to say. Um, my, my take on what I heard and my clarification on what I said was, was more rather than um, asking the lobbyists to seek modifications rather to um, see where it is going, because I don't see that the things that I've heard that were concerns are things that can be modified. For example, what I've heard is, I mean, I've articulated, we don't know where the alignment is, and I've heard a couple other people say, we don't know if we're gonna get service, which kind of sounds like the same thing. And that's not something you can modify in this bill. A couple other people have said, you know, we don't know about the taxation component or rather, you know, why Texas now when we didn't get Northwest service. And then other folks have said that they don't have authority yet and, and various other positions. And so that's why I suggested monitoring why at this juncture, I'm, I'm wondering whether or not we should um, not take a position because I'm, you know, when, when it was articulated to suggest that changes be made, I'm just not seeing that the things that we've raised concerns about are things that actually can be changed in this bill. And in my view, it's not always necessary to go back and say we need a change, especially when some of us aren't authorized to do that right now. And if, if CDOT has not, um, if, if CDOT and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission, which, which I do follow as closely as I can at this juncture, haven't um, set the alignment, I really don't see how that's going to afford a change in the bill, whether the lobbyist pounds the table super hard or not, and with all due respect. Thank you, Director Moldy. You might say, Madam Chair, if I could, you know, another option is we could, could we certainly could communicate the board's concerns to the sponsors of the bill. Uh, even even from a monitor position, we wouldn't necessarily have to add, you know, lobby for amendments if you don't want us to. Uh, but if you would like, we'd be willing to uh, communicate those concerns that are expressed tonight. Thank you for that option, Rich. That's really helpful. Director Levy. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think we should go ahead and communicate our concerns. Um, Dr. Cog is obviously a really big player in this bill, uh, given the amount of the size of our population and the taxing base that that um, this area would provide. But you you did a nice job of um, summarizing some of the issues that were raised that we might want our lobbyists to follow. And I just wanted to put maybe a little bit finer point on um, what um, Director Brockett said, um, and now <laughs> I've actually forgotten my point on that. Um, oh, I think it was about, yeah, holding, creating the district, but not giving it the taxing authority. I think, oh, I think the bill is being presented as an inducement to, um, to the federal government, Amtrak, whatever the, the vehicle is, to provide funding because of a demonstration that we are ready to step up and provide a state match. And I, I think that it, we, we could ask, you know, we could say that we would like that to be explicit in the bill that, that the taxing authority and the creation of the district wouldn't happen at all 
um, uh, until such time as there is federal funding. In other words, that the district would only be available to supplement federal funding because if you read the bill, this, this actually could be a vehicle to do the whole thing from start to finish, operate, collect fares, you know, the whole thing. And so I think making it contingent on uh, and only a supplement to federal funding would be really important. And then I think to um, Director Mulvey's point about what we really can accomplish regarding this alignment issue, um, it's very convenient for boundary purposes for the, for the sponsors to describe it to include all of Dr. Cog, but a simple way to solve Boulder's problems about double taxation would be to go the way they've, they've done it with respect to other sections of the route and only to have it encompass a certain distance um, on e either side of the alignment that's proposed. In other words, if the train's not coming to Boulder, then Boulder is not in the district. So I think there are some other ways to look at it that could um, protect uh, Boulder from being taxed uh, a second time for yet another train that we're not going to get. And so I, I do think it's worthwhile raising these issues given the, the weight that uh, Dr. Cog has on transportation issues at the Capitol. Thank you. Director Peck? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, about the alignment, um, I think one of the concerns for the whole district is that there are three RTD corridors fast track corridors that are being looked at as far as, far as connection points to front range passenger rail. Um, and, I, and I think uh, um, Commissioner Levy was speaking about Boulder County, not just Boulder, as far as if we cannot, if we cannot connect to that. My fear and, and perhaps my assumption of why this bill is out there now is that I am not sure if the alignment with RTD fast tracks, um, if, if, if one of those corridors is selected over the other two, that this would actually pass, this district would actually pass in those other alignments um, because of the problem of being double taxed. So um, I don't think you can put that in any kind of comments, but I just wanted to make that statement that the alignment is not just about front range passenger rail, but also how does that align with our unfinished corridors on fast tracks? Thank you, Director Peck. Director Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I was just wanting to ask if, a, if this bill is to put this to the voters under Tabor for creating a taxing district, is that what that is? Or is it actually establishing the district, which would be in violation of Tabor? And Rich, do you want to take yeah, that? Yeah, I think it puts it to the voters, or at least the taxing part. Yeah, I think I, in order to create it and have the taxing, you got to put it to the voters. Yeah, right. I think it, it creates the district and then asks the voters if they would implement a tax on the district. Yeah, and without the tax, it's kind of moot. But the, the directors of the new district would determine when and if to ask the voters. And it, it gives them a maximum amount of authority that they would be able to ask the voters about, but they could ask for any amount within that authority. That's, is that right, Rich? That's my understanding. If, if I could just add on Director that Lee. point. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Chair Stoltzman. Uh, as I read the bill, and I, I probably need to read it three or four more times, um, the district would be created and they could decide to go to a vote to create the tax without having specified the alignment. Now that may not be a very good idea politically, but they could. So we could be faced with being um, asked to tax ourselves for and not know whether we're going to get the train up in our neck of the woods. And I, and I did mean to frame all my comments in terms of Boulder County and not um, city of Boulder. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Director Atchison. I want to go back to uh, Director Brockett. The bill creates the funding and the authority to create the district. But the funding that's proposed to come from the federal government is to build the system. And that could last up to five years from the construction. But long term maintenance and operation is gonna come back 
to the districts that have to pay for it. So you're gonna get up, if you er end up in the district, you could end up paying the money through the tax process. To uh, Claire's point, there could be the potential of having this whole thing pass and then certain elements of the district may want to vote out of paying the tax. So then who gets to pay it is those left in. And without the alignment being finalized and the EIT on this alone, environmental assessment brother, could take five to 10 years. So we're, we are looking at something that could be not even approved from an environmental standpoint, nor have a route determined for another five to 10 years, but yet you're asking us to vote for something, not you, but the legislature is asking us to vote on this thing well before we know anything. Thank you, Director Atchison. So it sounds like the consensus of the group is to take a position of monitor, but to give staff direction to be actively engaged and to raise the points that have been brought up this evening. And this is not an exhaustive list of the points, but trying to summarize that while we are supportive of rail in the region, we have some serious concerns around representation of the group, uh, the alignment of the train, the formation of the taxation district, um, whether our populace is adequately represented, I guess I sort of double put that in, um, the timing of implementing a tax um, and some of the other process related questions around double taxation, the fact that we already have a transit district in our region and how that would interplay. Um, and the other comments that you heard um, from members this evening. Is that cl clear enough direction uh, to Rich and, and Jen and Ed, does that make sense? Yes, that, that makes sense to me. Are there any areas that you would like the board to elaborate on anymore, or, or do you feel like you have what you need? I think we're good at this point, point. Um, and the bill is up in the Senate Transportation Committee on Tuesday afternoon. That's Great. its first hearing. Great. All right. So if we could get a motion from someone to take a position of monitor, if everyone's okay with how that was summarized. So moved. Thank I'll you. Second. This is Sally Daigle. Thank you, Sally. Good to hear your voice. Oh man, I can't wait till we can all see each other in person again. <laughs> Me too. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And abstentions, if you could please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much. We will take a position of monitor. And Rich, that, that takes us through all of our new bills. Is that right? Yeah. And since we're talking about transporta transportation, uh, I wanted to ask Jen to, and we still have time in our agenda item. Um, and I wanted to ask Jen to uh, say a couple of words real quick about what was mentioned earlier, the, uh, the larger transportation funding bill that we're expecting from uh, Senator Winter and Representative Gray. And then I think uh, Jen, after she's done, we'll turn it over to Doug. Yep. Thank you, Rich. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. So feel a little bit like a broken record here saying that the, you know, the transportation plan should be introduced next week, but in fact, maybe it will be introduced next week. Um, as of right now, we, we are still waiting you know, in the beginning, we thought that the bill was going to be introduced in the in the beginning of March. Um, so, but I, I believe that that most of us should be aware right now of the main concepts in the transportation funding bill. Um, that's really essentially going to shift how we spend our transportation dollars and and how we collect those transportation dollars. Ed and I had a good conversation today with one of the bill sponsors of that bill. And he, he did mention that there really isn't an issue with anything necessarily in the bill. It's really more about the complexity of the bill, the length of the bill. And I think what he said that the bill was over 160 pages. So it, it really is, is maybe just a matter of logistics. So hopefully we will see it soon. Um, and and as, as Rich mentioned before, since it is likely um, that the bill will be introduced prior to our next board meeting in May. Um, I will then kick it over to Doug to, to discuss options for us on how we can stay engaged um, in this bill as it, as it is moving for, forward. 
Madam Chair, Dan, thank you both very much. I, I uh, yeah, I mean, I just understanding the importance of this bill, and uh, I know everybody on on this call is, is definitely aware of the components of this bill. Um, we want to be able to find um, the proper path to communicate once the bill comes out to you all. I would suggest to you that we'll definitely articulate our comments via email to, to the board. Um, but we are open to any suggestions that you might have to stay engaged in this, whether that be a special meeting if we feel um, the need to take a position on this sooner rather than later. Of course, you know, as, as Chair Stolzman mentioned earlier, uh, the problems with just meeting once a month is that we meet just once a month, right? So we can only take action, um, you know, positions on bills when we, when, we, uh, when we get together. And because of the timing of this bill dropping, um, you know, and not knowing the speed in which it's gonna go through, through the chambers, um, it gives us a little bit of pause. And we wanna, because of the enormity of this bill, I think it's important that Dr. Cog weigh in or stay actively engaged. So, um, you know, once we know more, if it does indeed drop next week, um, you know, we'll be in contact. And I would suggest to, uh, to the board that we'll stay engaged with the executive committee and make a determination whether we need to uh, hold a special meeting or wait to to our our May board meeting to uh, to possibly take take a position. Madam Chair, back to you. Thank you, Executive Director Rex, and thank you for the excellent update on, on all that's happening under the dome. So that takes us to our informational briefings, and so everybody fill up your cup of coffee and get ready. Ashley Summers, our manager on regional planning and development is going to take us through a briefing on the regional data acquisition program. And every time we hear from Ashley, you learn about things that are available to your community at a much reduced price, super cool technology. And I can't wait to find out what we're gonna to hear tonight. So Ashley, if you'll please tell us what you'd like to tell us. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. Uh, well, tonight I'm going to give you an update on our um, active data acquisition projects. It will be relatively painless. Um, so we have been facilitating aerial imagery acquisition in the region since 2002. And we've been expanding these offerings to include other foundational data sets like LIDAR, which is elevation data, planometric data, which are elements of the built environment like building outlines, and now, uh, starting tomorrow, we're planning to add land cover to our suite of offerings. Um, so that'll be brand new. We're currently in the middle of our 2020, 2021 project cycle. So they run for, for two years. It takes that long to develop this suite of products. This cycle that we're in right now is the most ambitious that we've ever tried to date because we're offering four foundational data sets that our member governments can buy into if they so choose. The imagery project is complete. Uh, the LIDAR project is approximately 60% complete, and we've just started the planimetric project. Uh, we're planning to start land cover um, tomorrow based on uh, a finance and budget uh, resolution earlier today. We do this work as a consortium because it saves our member governments time and money, and it also creates regional data sets that are consistent and high quality across the whole region, which improves the quality of mapping and analysis work that your staff may be doing. These are just some of ex the examples of uses, so you know what these things can be applied to. Imagery serves as a common base map for print and web map products. It's also the input for derivative products that we make like planometrics and land cover. So you have to have the imagery first to build on it. LIDAR, which is elevation data, um, shows you what the, the ground looks like. So it helps you with things like construction planning um, and water modeling. Planometric data, which itemizes elements of the built environment like building footprints or sidewalk center lines can be used for things like asset management, um, emergency response, event planning, and a whole host of other analyses. And land cover data, which is our new one, can be used to assess urban streams and trees and even for the identification of strategic lands for conservation, among many other things. Dr. Cog has been responsive to evolving and emerging, emerging needs for data. For example, roughly half of our members wanted a supplementary imagery source to pair with our traditional offering that was more frequent um, so they could understand development in their areas uh, better. 
So Dr. Cog contracted with a separate company this year to offer a menu of a la carte items to pair with our traditional offering if the partners needed that. Additionally, some of our partners experienced resource, resource shortages this past year, meaning that they couldn't devote enough staff time to checking their own deliverables. Um, in this, this particular case with the imagery, we were able to uh, partner with a local community college and train those students to do some of that evaluation on their behalf, which was a great partnership that um, was beneficial to the students and also um, to our local government staff. And then finally, we know that budgets have been getting tighter and we need to find creative solutions for funding. So Dr. Cog pursued and was awarded both federal and state grants to help fund our current projects. You can see here the breakdown of project funding and you may notice that Dr. Cog funds and grant funding are closing the gaps on the newer data sets that we're offering. The total value for the data of, that we're producing in our current cycle is $2.9 million. And member governments have access to all of this at a small fraction of that cost. I would like to say thank you to the 41 local governments that are participating on these projects and also to the 15 public partners that also contribute. Uh, I'll close today by just saying that Dr. Cog understands that the data needs of your staff are constantly evolving. So to keep tabs on that, we, um, especially with the consortium this large, we do a lot of outreach. That includes frequent surveys and interviews to hear from your staff and what they need. And your staff are also invited to be on review committees whenever we evaluate vendors. So they end up making that selection. Dr. Cog just facilitates that process. To help your staff decide if, when, and how to engage with these projects, Dr. Cog provides customized comprehensive quotes for the products that we offer. And this is timely. And one of the reasons why I'm here tonight is to let you know that your staff received quotes to participate in the 2022 project cycle last week to help inform your upcoming budget processes. Um, I know many of those are, have already started or, or are about to start. And so uh, all of your staff will have something in hand so that they can um, decide what they want to buy into, if anything, and uh, will be informed in that regard. And the last point here is that uh, we know that staff is constantly changing. And so we are uh, reaching out to those staff and onboarding them so they know what their options are and also their history with these projects, what, what they've received in the past, um, how they've contributed, and um, you know what their options for the future are. I know that was quick, but uh, I'll, I'll end there and ask if there are any questions or any places where I can elaborate. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ashley this evening? I'm not seeing any, but it is always fantastic to have opportunities to save our communities um, time and energy and funding and then be able to have such high quality products to have access to that we really, like a small community like mine would never have access to such high quality products. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, that was fantastic. And that takes us to our committee reports. Um, so first up is the State Transportation Advisory Committee that Tammy and I attended on behalf of the group, Director Maurer and I, and um, we heard a really great presentation about a uh, Bustang microtransit product, uh, project, so that will improve um, Bustang and Snowstang service during peak traffic Friday through Sundays on I-70. It's very exciting. Um, so next time you go skiing, please take snow staying. And if you haven't ever tried it, take bus staying. There are great services that are offered to our communities and help spread the word. We learned a little bit more about Senate Bill 267 third year funding discussion. Um, we'll be taking action on that later on. We got an update on greenhouse gas rulemaking. Um, still, you know, lots of discussions in process about how the greenhouse gas rulemaking will impact our transportation projects and how we'll have to measure improvement on that over time. Um, and um, we had a report um, on the statewide transportation improvement program. It was just an informational update, but in April, the Transportation Commission will be acting on that. That takes us to the report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman. Uh, the Metro Mayor's Caucus met last on April 15th. We uh, we're pleased to welcome the three members of, uh, of uh, Senator Hickenlooper's Colorado staff. 
We uh, spent a good deal of time reviewing the uh, current transportation legislation that's pending in the state legislature and discussed the merits and, uh, and, and opportunities in that, in that piece of legislation. Uh, we also had a discussion on Senate Bill 62 uh, concerning reduced jail, uh, jail uh, populations. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Starker. Director Baker will tell us about the report from the um, Metro Area County Commissioners. I saw Director Baker earlier. Director Baker, if you are talking, you're on mute. All right, I might turn it over to another commissioner. There were Buffalo in the background of Director Baker, so I hope nothing happened. No, okay. No commissioners He's would not like to on. Give... Oh, okay, we lost all the commissioners. We will save the update from the uh, Metro Area County Commissioners for next month. And so that takes us to the Advisory Committee on Aging. Madam Chair, this is Doug. Um, I, Jayla lost connection. I don't know if she's back on. Uh, if not, I'll go ahead and do it. Please do. Not, that would be great. All right. Um, so the, uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging met last Friday, and um, they, they approved or recommended for approval the AAA contractor allocations that uh, Director Shaw mentioned that the F&B took up for action this evening. They also discussed the formation of a subcommittee for community-based uh, services, to provide a stronger voice as we have uh, conversations at the Capitol about um, the importance of, um, uh, of additional funding for our community-based providers to provide the service that we know um, we're going to need as part of the uh, hospital trans tra transformation program. So uh, we got a legislative update, talked about homebound COVID vaccine discussion. And I would also like to mention that in, a, in addition to the subcommittee on community-based uh, services, the um, ACA has formed a subcommittee on, uh, uh, for transportation services. And we've had a couple meetings now and we're trying to come up with some innovative solutions and how we can provide mobility for our older adults. As every, everybody knows, it is one of the top two issues that have always been mentioned in surveys with regards to um, you know, issues concerning our older adults. So uh, we're, we're excited to have uh, members, uh, actually uh, uh, Director Jim Dale sitting on that, that, that subcommittee and being chaired by former mayor, Kathy Noon. Right on, thank you for, for that great update. That takes us to you again, Executive Director X for the report on the Regional Air Quality uh, Council. Yes, thank you very much. We met on April 9th. Um, and uh, we had a, actually Jacob and, and Alvin gave an update on the, on the uh, 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, Heath, Heath Haig gave a presentation on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Roadmap and Climate Planning Efforts associated with. Um, and we also received a presentation similar to the one that we received tonight on the Employer uh, Traffic Reduction Program. Thank you very much. And so E470, uh, present past Chair Dyack. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a couple items. So uh, the board um, considered and approved a resolution regarding the Sable Boulevard interchange that was a relocation from Potomac. Uh, we approved a consultant contract for our new road widening project. Uh, the new project is gonna be from I-70 to 104th. They'll get started on their design work this year. Uh, we also approved a uh, contract with Salesforce to uh, be our new back office architecture platform provider. Commissioner Teal, I hope I said that correctly. And uh, the last item is we, did an, we had an annual accident analysis and uh, happy to report there were zero deaths on the tollway. That concludes my report, Madam Chair, thank you. That is a really great update and I'm so excited that E470 is realizing Vision Zero, way to go. That takes us to our next report, which is from CDOT, and Director Rebecca White will tell us what she'd like to tell us. Uh, good evening, board. It's nice to see you all. Um, as is often the case, the report on the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee is a, a good glimpse in issues before the department, so I'll just mention a couple other items tonight. One, we are still plowing snow in mid-April. Uh, hope to see the end here soon. 
Um, and the second more seriously is just a reminder that um, due to the state stimulus dollars of 30 million, we are um, in the process of accepting applications for the Revitalizing Main Streets program. There are two components to that, a large grant po program focused on safety. Those applications are due May 14th. And then a small grant program really focused more on COVID response. Those are ongoing rolling applications. So I just encourage uh, all the communities to take a look at that and submit an application. You can Google CDOT Revitalizing Main Streets and find a pretty good website that has everything. That's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for keeping the good news rolling. More grant opportunities. Thanks for that update. And last, we'll end with a report on fast tracks from Director Van Meter. Thank you, Chair. Directors, um, my report is going to focus on just one item, and that is the Northwest Rail Peak Service Plan that the RTD Board has been discussing and considering um, actively over the past few months. At their April 6th meeting, staff presented the peak service concept. That's three trips in the morning from Longmont to Denver and three evening trips from Denver to Longmont as a potential focus for a um, what has been termed a level two study. So we identified our potential partners and regional um, collaboration opportunities, which included um, outreach that's already begun with the corridor communities, the Burlington or the BNSF Railroad, the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal agencies, CDOT, the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission and Amtrak. We talked with the board about what we heard from the jurisdictions and re in recent outreach. Um, talked about the potential for this level two study that has received a, a fair amount of press and um, lip service in terms of looking at the will of the people and funding, coordination with the BNSF, project delivery operations and planning requirements. So we presented to the board options, three options, a level one, a level two, and a level three option for proceeding with an analysis on the corridor and the board congealed around, I would say, level two analysis, which would be something akin to a planning and environmental linkages level study, environmental fatal flaws, um, would include a high level of community engagement, would allow us the opportunity to update plans, designs to work to 30% design engineering, revisit technical or vehicle technology and impacts. It's a planning effort and study effort that would take 18 to 24 months, we believe, and cost between five and $8 million. Given the board's interest in proceeding with this um, path forward, RTD staff is now working on preparing a more detailed scope of work that we'll bring back to our board of directors this summer. We are continuing to engage key stakeholders, including local jurisdictions as we move forward in that process. And um, the proposed or probable source of funds for that five to $8 million study on the peak service plan for Northwest Rail uh, would be the Fast Tracks Internal Savings Account or FISA. Um, so moving forward, we will be, as I've stated, working on a uh, scope of work. If the board then gives us approval this summer, we would proceed with the solicitation and award and that 18 to 24 month um, project would likely kick off in early 2020. So that's the key fast tracks related item that I had to report this evening. Thank you very much for that update. So in your packet, everyone will find in attachment J an informational item from Todd Cottrell again, our senior transportation planner and transportation in transportation planning and operations. It's a, a transportation improvement program administrative modifications informational briefing. So enjoy that as you um, are looking for some bedtime reading this evening, if you like. And that takes us to our uh, administrative items to announce that our next meeting's May 19th. And I'd like to ask members if there are any other matters they would like to raise to the group. First one is from Director Dale. I thought it might be of interest to the group that 
thanks to the Smart City Alliance, Easy Mile, Colorado School of Mines, and City Golden, we're going to be piloting autonomous microbus routes around the campus and mostly on the campus, but one that loops down to close to downtown. And this should start like in the beginning of the fall semester, like August. And we're pretty excited to see how this works out. There'll be about 12 mile on our buses and they'll have, uh, try to have a loop time of seven, 12 minutes. And uh, it will be an exciting adventure and Rep Bridges is probably pretty excited to think about this himself. So uh, thanks for listening. That is a very cool update, Director Dale. If you could send us um, the dates when that the grand opening for that is, I bet you'd get a bunch of directors down there to ride those autonomous buses. That sounds awesome. Thanks for telling us. Any other banners by members? All right, seeing none, uh, we will adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Everyone, have a great day. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.